Okay, hello everyone. I believe I am live. I hope you are all well and everyone's keeping sane inside. Um, I'm excited to do another episode. These have been uh, these have been a lot of fun, and I think and I hope uh, people are enjoying these. It seems to um, people seem to be enjoying them, which is good, and it's why I keep doing them. So we will continue. <laughs> Um, I'm going to try and do an episode Monday to Friday at the very least uh, with potential episodes over the weekend. Um, we'll just sort of see what happens. Tomorrow I am going to be live on Instagram at half 12 with, or approximately half 12 with John of Antique Watch Company UK. Um, he has had a store here in London, him and his father, for 47 years. Uh, one of the longest running stores probably in the UK that's still completely family run and still um, just just really those guys that are running it. So that should be an interesting thing tomorrow. And again, that's on Instagram. I'm unsure what I'm going to do YouTube-wise tomorrow, if I will do a YouTube live as well. Um, we'll just see. We'll see how things go and we'll see how long that lasts. Um, so hello, Neville. How are you doing? Hello, William. How are you guys doing? Uh, you two have tuned in to, to most episodes, so thank you very much. Um, today, it's a bit too early for a cider, like yesterday, so we're going Red Bull. That is what's going to be fueling this episode. Unfortunately, not sponsored by Red Bull, but maybe one day. <laughs> oh, perfect. So, um, today we're going to be looking at chronographs. So, I have a box full of chronographs here. And we're just going to be picking them out, talking about them, um, discussing different aspects. And obviously, as always, answering your guys and girls' questions. So, at any point you have a question about anything, uh, watches in general... Uh, it doesn't have to just be chronographs, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. So we'll start with a wrist check, which is a chronograph. So let's get this in focus. Might help if my mouse is with me. Um, let's get this in focus. So this is one of my latest pieces. It is the Gakota PO2. Really, really cool watch. So this watch right now is on sale at Gakota for £139. And what that gets you is this beautiful polished and brushed case. Uh, it's a 40 millimeter case. It wears incredibly well. It's a bi-register chronograph. Now, the dial on the right side is a 24 hour. The dial on the left side is a 60 minute totalizer with your central chronograph seconds. The date down there is six. And you have a pulsation scale on the inside and a very multi-textured dial. Let's see if I can get in on that. There we go. It is a beautiful watch. You have a domed sapphire crystal. And all that for £140. Now, the movement inside this is a Seiko Mecha Quartz. So, it doesn't have a running seconds, which means you don't see any uh, quartz movement, really. And when you start the chronograph, you also don't really see any quartz movement. So, there it goes. Beating away. Mecha Quartz um, offer the same sort of standard that you'd get with a mechanical chronograph, which we'll move on to. But it does it in a quartz capacity. So you get the reliability of quartz and the ease of quartz and the affordability of quartz, but you get the satisfaction of mechanical. And that's why the Seiko Mecha Quartz are so popular and so common in micro brands, sort of under £300. The nice thing is it stops and starts like a normal chronograph would, and the reset, this is where it's quite interesting, Hold on. is a snapback, just like a mechanical chronograph. So a really cool piece, that. Really, really cool, and I think for the price as well, you're not gonna you're not really gonna get much better at that price. So yeah, uh, Neville says very well, thanks, and you, yeah, I'm good, thank you, I'm very good, I cannot complain. Again, I'm healthy, uh, as is the people close to me, and I hope that's the same for you guys and girls out there, and that is the most important thing. Uh, William says doing good, thank you, James. Uh, watching the stream and enjoying the sun in my garden, very nice. I'd like to shoot these in the garden. The only thing is, I've got neighbours that are constantly out so you'd hear them and they'd also hear me and I don't really want to be sat in my back garden with uh, with all these watches <laughs> so much better to do it this way um, so on the in the watch box uh, we've got a series of uh, modern uh, chronographs as well as a couple of vintage ones down here in the middle and sort of everything in between as well so we're just going to pick up watches and sort of get, get going with uh, with a few different things, talk about a few different things and show a couple of options uh, chronograph wise and, and what you can get. Um, my dad says Gakota are a great value, yeah 100% you have the PO3 I believe it or PO5, one of them, very good. Navsen says got my coffee in one hand and my cheap NATO. <laughs> 
How you doing, Navsan? How you doing? He's always here, causing trouble. That's what he's here for. <laughs> so what we'll do, we'll start with my two most favourite ones in the centre. So I'll put them in the centre. Let's go. Neville says, I, I am so close to buying the Gekota. It's been on my radar for some time. You should pull the trigger, man. I mean, whilst they're so cheap and they're limited to 100 production run as well. Um, so a lot of value for money. Um, and if you like the look and the design, that's what matters. So we'll start with probably my most favourite watch that I have for sale at the moment. You'll have to excuse the camera work again, guys and girls. So this is the Amiga Speedmaster Dark Side of the Moon Apollo 8. Now, what you see here is a black ceramic case. So not black PVD or anything like that, black ceramic. And it has the 1861 caliber. So it is still just a standard Speedmaster professional caliber inside. However, it has been completely redecorated and completely altered, really, to be able to have the finishing that you see here, which is very similar to that of the moon. That's the goal that they've done. And in doing so, they've renamed the caliber the 1869. So whilst the architecture, layout, and everything is the exact same as the 1861, which is what you get in the standard Speedmaster Professional, they've renamed the caliber because it is so different in its in its uh, finishing and also the, the way they've stripped the movement down and removed certain things to give you more viewing pleasure and also give you an open work dial partially. Uh, they've renamed the whole caliber. So a really, really cool piece this. absolutely love it. Um, Ian says, hello, James. How you doing? How you doing, Ian? Hope you're well. Um, this is one of my favorite watches of all time, but definitely from uh, Amiga and the Speedmaster line. It is a really, really cool watch. So black ceramic, 44 millimeters. So it is a bit bigger than the standard Speedmaster Professional. Um, now, a lot of people will look at that dimension and go, that is too big. Now, the important thing is the look-to-look -look length, and it's something that's not spoken about enough. Everyone always goes on about the case size, and of course that is important, but the look-to-look -look dimension is far more important because that's what determines sort of the, the wrist ergonomics, the way it actually wears on the wrist. Because you can wear something that is 46 millimeters case size, but very short look-to-look, -look, and therefore it will look fine on most wrists. So the look-to-look -look of this is only one millimeter bigger than the standard Speedmaster. So if you've ever considered this watch but not gone for it because of the case size, I'd rethink it. If you can wear the normal Speedmaster, you can wear this. Of course, it wears a little bit bigger, but it wears well. Another cool feature about this watch is the luminescence. So obviously, you've got luminescence on the indices and the hands as per normal, but the bezel inlay is completely luminescent, and randomly, the crown on the, the Amiga symbol in the crown is also luminescent, so quite a cool watch. Really great looking piece, and one of my favourites, as I said, from Speed uh, from Amiga at the moment. It's really, really cool. Awesome movement and awesome finishing. Yeah, the finishing is incredible. I think it's uh, it shows what Amiga can do when they sort of put their mind to it, rather than just releasing a different colour. Um, and I think that's why I like this. You know, Amiga have obviously done a lot of Speedmasters, um, and they're always coming out with new special editions. And you know, some of them are really, really nice. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I just think this is one that is so different from the herd um, and just stands out on its own merits rather than just being a, a recolor. You know, I mean, you've got black ceramic case, you've got the highly finished movement, highly decorated, um, highly altered as well. Um, it's just a cool watch. I think we'll look back on that in 10, 20 years as a, as a piece of, do you remember when Amiga did that? You know, and that's probably how we we'll refer to it. And of all the ones that are in black ceramic, I think this is the nicest. They do a couple of other variants in the... Uh, coaxial range uh, in the dark side of the moon series but they're just not they're just not as good in my opinion and they're also very illegible um, if you've ever seen them in person they're just incredibly illegible and that coaxial movement adds so much thickness you know we've got one here and I can give you the comparison of thickness and you can see uh, you should be able to see how much of a difference that makes and this is quite a, an illusion as well because there's a thick sapphire crystal back which domes out beyond the actual case so you can't even really see it um, initially let me get the focus in there we go. so you can't really see it initially but that is quite a heavy dome I mean you can see it a lot from this angle so that protrudes quite a bit now the coaxial movements are incredible, and they offer an insane amount. Um, 
in terms of their meta certification and everything else from standard uh, movement so they are incredible movements but they are just so thick and it does make the watches quite a chunk so whilst the case size of this is is not too bad the thickness of it does mean it wears quite large and this one is the Amiga Speedmaster 57 coaxial so based on the Amiga Speedmaster from 1957 you've got the the beautiful arrow hands a nice two register layout with a date down there at six this is a really great looking watch and they also made this um, as a special edition or limited edition I believe it was um, in the exact proportions as the 57 with the three register layout so the, it's almost an identical replica of the 1957 Amiga Speedmaster manually wound that is a watch that I personally want to own um, and I, I cannot wait to hopefully have that in my personal collection but this is the coaxial version of that watch and it's nice, you know, I think it's quite nice that they do the reversed of what most bracelets do. You've got brushed down the centre and polished on the outside as opposed to most of the time polished on the inside with brushed on the outside. Great looking piece. But that coaxial movement does add a lot of thickness. And I think for someone with a bigger wrist, you know, I have a six and three quarter inch wrist. Um, so for me, I can't personally, in my opinion, pull it off. But again, that is opinion and it sort of depends on what you find comfortable and also your wrist size. So we've covered the Speedmaster Dark Side of the Moon, and we've covered the 57 briefly. Um, we'll move on to some other ones, see what people are saying. William says, Amiga can really do some amazing watchmaking. I love their DeVille Turbion. That's a stunning watch. Yeah, the um, Amiga do offer some great pieces. I mean, they've got the Aquaterra Well Timer, uh, which is a massively underrated watch, and it's just gorgeous. Um, again, it is, <laughs> I think they made it in platinum, and the price range is just insane. Um, but for when you consider what you get and the hand painting and the hand finishing and everything like that, you know, they do offer an incredible amount of value. So the next watch we're going to talk about, because it is one of my personal favorites and a watch again, I do hope to own someday in the personal collection, um, is this Zenith, crazy Zenith, unapologetically 70s, as I always say whenever I pick it up, with the integrated bracelet design, just bonkers so they call there's a series of nicknames with this uh, the el primero tv screen the big blue there's there's a couple of other nicknames people call it as well um it's again unapologetically 70s crazy square case very very deep dial um i'll show you that so it's quite a thick watch as well but because of the the overall design and again how it's so wide this way but so short this way and because the lugs are integrated they come straight off the bracelet even if you have a small wrist, you can wear this watch. And the dial, as you can see, is very, very deep on that. It just looks so cool. The depth, when you look down at this on your wrist, it just screams 70s. Now, this is the Zenith uh, El Primero. Now, they also made it in collaboration with Movado. So you might find a Movado with the El Primero. Um, and it will also still have, in a lot of cases, the Zenith logo. So it might say Movado, it'll have the Zenith logo and it'll have an El Primero inside. Zenith and Movado did a lot of things back in the day, not just on watches like this, they did them on sort of classic dress watches as well, with some of the Movado Zenith collaboration high beat uh, mechanical movements. So they even collaborated on the movements themselves as opposed to just the watches. So quite an interesting collaboration back in the day that Movado and Zenith had. But really cool watch this. The pushers are actual rocker pushers built into the case. So these actually push in and rock. It's really, really cool. The bracelet has a folding in clasp, so it sort of folds out and snaps out. And the links you can see, really, really cool. One of my favorite pieces. Again, I have, um, and I showed it, I think I've showed it in every episode so far. Um, I have a 1970s Zenith Defy, um, and this is very similar in its design. This wasn't officially part of the Defy range, but it might as well have been because the case design and the architecture in the bracelet is almost identical to the Defies that they were doing of the era. Um, really cool piece. Really, really cool piece. And again, you have to be very much into the 70s design to, to like that watch. Uh, not everyone does, and so not everyone is into that era. So I understand not everyone will like that. Uh, the 57 has a great sapphire case back on it. Yeah, the sapphire case back is incredible. I mean, as far as, as construction goes, to build a dome sapphire like that, and the fact that they've made it a sapphire crystal, um, as opposed to stainless steel and a block, um, it does curve a little bit more on the wrist. So it does it, it, it gives the illusion that it sits flatter than what it actually does. So they have made it well, um, but that thickness definitely is there. I've got the Bell 1911 with the El Primero movement. Yeah, Bell used um, a lot of... El Primero, El Primero 
Zenith back in in the in the seven, even even before then, you know, they were famous for their movements. It's what it's what they did so incredibly well. They made high beat uh, mechanical movements even just before the El Primero. So they they are known for that, and they many brands used them. Abel, um, even Tag Heuer in the Link range. There's a Link with the caliber 36. So any Tag Heuer that has the caliber 36 is the El Primero. So they're quite collectible pieces, um, regardless of whether you like the Link or not. <laughs> Um, but again, the El Primero is a classic. Zenith is a classic, and we have another Zenith on the table up here, which also has an El Primero. I believe it's the 401, uh, 4069, or something along those lines. Did I write it on the tag? 4069, yes. Um, and this is another really cool piece. Two register chrono this time, no date. And we spoke about this one yesterday because it was in, in that live stream. Again, I am so glad Zenith avoided. The urge to add a date onto this watch um, it just creates such a clean and beauty to this this dial and this is the cp2 based on obviously vintage uh, aviation watches of the era um, very similar to some of the things like blanc um did and a couple of other brands really cool vintage styling on the bracelet just overall a really beautiful watch again a little bit thicker but the way they've integrated the case back allows it to sit a bit more flush on the wrist because that part slopes over so you, you don't realize how thick it is it is a big watch but then again with the design and the inspiration um, it should be uh, a big watch you know it shouldn't be a small watch so again a really beautiful design and I think massively underrated. I, I, I do believe Zenith are underrated, especially when you consider the history and what you get for your money. Uh, granted, at retail, they are quite costly and you can get discounts at retail. Um, and pre-owned, they're, they're still not cheap. But I think comparative to what else you can get in the market, they are, you know, they're definitely in, in comparison with Amiga Speedmasters. Um, I think there's no question about that. So a really cool piece. We've got a couple of... Um, well, I would say one or two, two slightly more unusual watches. Let's, let's take a look at these. So we'll start off with this one, which definitely won't be to everyone's taste um, <laughs> for a multitude of reasons. This is a Jean Richard Aeroscope. Not just any Aeroscope. To anyone who knows uh, football, they will see that logo uh, for the spinning uh, second hand and know exactly what that is. That is Arsenal um, or the Gunners. So if you're into football... This is, or, or if you're a fan of Arsenal, this is probably a cool watch to you because you know you've got that connection. Now, if you're not into football, um, like myself, I don't really watch football. I don't really care about football, in all honesty. Um, it just looks like a cannon. <laughs> so, I mean, get away with it to some level. It's not got Arsenal plastered all over it. It doesn't say it's. You know, I, I think. They've done the right thing of incorporating the logo, which is quite a cool logo in itself, without plastering Arsenal all over the watch. So it does make it wearable um, to someone who maybe isn't into football and just likes the design. So a really cool watch. The texture on the dial is awesome. Let me get in nice and close and get that focusing. There you go. You can see that a bit better now. It's got like a, um, a proper honeycomb dial in the, in the true sense of... Um, you know where where the honey is made really cool really really cool you've got black titanium uh, which is coated um, so it's just a really cool watch let me show you can't really see the back but Jean Richard strap which has the JR logo built in folding clasp and I'll show you on the wrist great legibility on that Zenith yeah 100% the legibility is unquestionable um, on that Zenith for sure. So let me show you this Jean Richard on wrist. It is quite a well proportioned watch. Of course, it's a big watch. It's not a small watch by any stretch of the imagination, but it wears incredibly well. It's it's very similar in its its dimensions to what a turtle, like a Seiko turtle, would wear, like or, or even a Panerai, um, one of the uh, radio mirrors as opposed to a Luminol. With the wire looks, you know, you've got this wide case, but very very short looks like. They're almost non-existent. Really cool watch. Really great design. And inside this is um, something that a couple of brands do. And we've got another one on here which which has that. And I think a few of the watches on the table might even have... Um, actually, no, I think it's just this. But basically what is referred to as a stacked movement. Um, this has a automatic movement inside, um, like most of these watches do. 
with a module built on top. So what that means is you've got inside this, there's a debris de poire, um, I think that's how I pronounce it, so apologies if it's not, a module built on top of a Salita SW300. So what that means is you've technically got two movements stacked on top of each other, working together to give you the automatic time and date as per normal, but then also the chronograph. They're sort of separated from each other, working together, if that makes sense. Now, um, where you've probably heard that term or know of it more commonly is in the Speedmaster reduced line or the, the automatic line. So the smaller variants, the 39mm variants of Speedmasters, not all of them have that, um, but some of them do have the stacked movements. Um, a, com a common way to sort of tell, and you can see it on this watch because this has one as well, is, um, we discussed it before, the crown is slightly off center to the pushers, it's slightly down. The reason being, obviously, they're stacked differently. So that is that right there. The internet was cutting in and out there, guys. So sorry if uh, if you couldn't hear me. Um, I'm trying to see if the chat is working. It says unable to connect to chat. Give me a few seconds, guys. I'm sorry if it's uh, if it's cut out. Internet at the moment and across the the whole country really. So internet is uh, being bottlenecked and and uh, brought back. So again, apologies. Can still hear you. Uh, why use a module rather than just a 7750? There's a few reasons. Um, so the Valju 7750 is a great integrated chronograph movement that sort of has everything you want with it. We've got a couple of Valjus on the table. This is a 7734, um, but it's quite old architecture. Um, you know, it's been going for a very, very long time, and sometimes the cost is actually easier for a brand to use something different. Also, some brands just can't get the agreements to get the Baoju 7750s or the ETA 7750s, and so on and so on. So they have to look at alternative options, and sometimes they just want a different layout to what they might typically get uh, with those movements. Maybe the spacing between the dials or the the different things. There's, there's a few reasons, and uh, tomorrow, as I said, I'm going to be doing a live stream with um, with John of Anti Watch Company uh, on Instagram. So keep an eye out for that. It's going to be about half twelve. He is a watchmaker at trade, um, so he strips. You know, he just worked on a three two one Speedmaster on a Longo. He works on Rolex GMTs. He works on everything down to down to Seikos. So I'll be asking him some of those questions as well, and trying to understand a bit more myself um, with regards to these different things. And, and why exactly these um, stacked movements aren't so well received by watchmakers. I think the, the common answer usually is the fact that it's like working on two movements because you have to strip two separate components, uh, two separate movements, and basically build them back together and, and connect them back together, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, again, apologies about the internet if, uh, if it is cutting in and out. It seems on my end, based on what I can see, it's okay at the moment, but it is fluctuating in and out. Um, again, apologies. Working with limited resources with what we have. <laughs> so that is the Jean Richard, which is a really cool watch. Really, really cool watch. Let's have a look at the other one we've got on the table, which also has one of the stacked movements, which is this lovely watch right here. So I'm a huge fan of this. This is the Chapard Milli Miglia. Um, again, I always get the pronunciation wrong, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, and this is for the race that happens in Italy um, with with the cars. So they have all kinds of different cars that, that do this race and participate in, uh, I believe it's a thousand miles. Again, um, you'll have to forgive me on the specifics if I'm getting it wrong, but it's a very cool collaboration that I believe started in 1984 or 87. It was one of those years. Um, and it started with a quartz watch that had a mecha quartz movement, very similar to the Kakota I showed you earlier. Um, and I have owned and sold that original Chapard, the very first Chapard Milli Miglia they ever collaborated with, or Milli Miglia. Uh, is it Milli Miglia? I think it's Milli Miglia. Uh, again, apologies for pronunciations. Um, but this is a really cool one because it's titanium and you have a carbon fiber dial. So let me get up nice and close with that. There we go. So nice carbon fiber dial 
right there, which just looks absolutely awesome. Plus, I've always just liked the design. You know, you've got this this uh, tire tread rubber strap. It's just a really cool watch. You can see probably a bit closer now. Um, the the way the crown is not perfectly aligned with the pushers, and that is a, a usual indicator of a, a, a modular movement. So it's sort of stacked in its in its construction. But really cool watch this. Absolutely love it. You know what, this webcam works pretty well with, with getting nice and close once it's in focus. See the detailing there. Gorgeous piece. I do want to own a Chapard Milli Millia um, in the personal collection at some point. Really cool piece. So we've looked at a few pieces now. We've looked at the Speedmaster Dark Side of the Moon, the 57 Quaxial. The uh, Zenith El Primero Big Blue or TV, the Jean Richard, the other Zenith up here, and the Chapard down here. So we've got two vintage pieces and two more modern pieces to take a look at. So let's move on to another Speedmaster. So this is a Speedmaster Reduced um, or Automatic, depending on what you like to call them. Let's try and get this back in focus. There we go. So this features a really lovely silver dial with obviously a silver bezel and stainless steel case so there's a lot of silver going on here now if we get nice and close you can see what this movement has so you can see at the very top you've got a 30 minute chronograph counter with the day of the week and the month in there on the left you have what is the running seconds um, let's give it a wine and we can get it going you have the running seconds and the 24 hour subdial Need a little bit more juice. <laughs> Here we go. Now it's going. So you can see over there, running seconds and a 24 hour subdial. At the very bottom, you have the 12 hour indicator for the chronograph, central seconds for the chronograph, and a pointer date. So you've got quite a lot going on on this watch. And at times, it can be a little bit illegible or a little bit more uh, difficult to tell what the time is. It's a really cool watch nonetheless, really great design, and if you were looking for a complicated Speedmaster at a fraction of the cost, these are perfect. I mean, you're not really going to find much better at these kind of prices. Really gorgeous watch, and I'll show you on wrist how it wears different. So here we go, let's get that focus in. There we go. So you can see how it wears on wrist. It is a quite a bit smaller than a standard Speedmaster. A standard Speedmaster comes in at 42 millimeters, whereas this is at 39 millimeters. It's like 39.5, um, and it wears so so well, and it just looks great. I personally owned a Speedmaster Reduced again in these same dimensions. Uh, it was a Berthier one from me from '97. This one is from 2005. They still make the automatics or the Reduced, whatever you want to call them, um, at retail. However, they are slightly different, um, a lot sportier in their design. They do a lot of racing uh, inspiration. They also do a lot of ladies' watches. So, you know, pink dials and straps and stuff like that and diamonds and everything like that in this range. So a really great option for both him or for her. Although I think anyone can wear any watch, really. <laughs> I want to add a Chapard OEC to my collection one day. Yeah, William, they're, they are cool watches. I think they offer, um, offer a really cool design and really cool option. Um, beyond the, the standard stuff you, you come to expect. Next we're going to look at a watch that we have looked at on the live streams already, um, but it's just a really cool watch. Uh, this is the Bremont Alt 1C Dash uh, Blue. Really gorgeous design, really, really gorgeous design. It is a chronometer. Um, they use a Swiss movement inside these, so whilst it states London at the bottom, it is a Swiss made movement. We'll show you that movement in a minute. Got beautiful leaf hands. Running seconds over there are at three o'clock. A thirty-minute totalizer at uh, at three o'clock. Sorry, the running seconds are at nine o'clock with that vibrant sixty. It does have concentric circles in the subdials, which just add a really nice texture, and a nice contrast against the blue. Date down there at six. Again, very very clean, very legible, and very very nice design. Um, you have the famous triptych case, which is uh, what uh, what Bremont use. So you have three pieces that are basically combined together to create the case. You have the top part, which integrates the lugs and the bezel. You have the mid case, which integrates where the movement sits. And it has a, 
an integrated um, shock absorbent uh, absorption sort of technology that that Bremont built and uh, use on all their watches. And then you have the case back. And let's show you that movement. Really great looking piece. Uh, where's the focus? There it is. And you have their rotor that they make, and they finish these in house. Very very nice design. So that is a really cool piece. Um, Remington says, I'm thinking about buying the Tudor Black Bay 36 tune. Do you ever regret buying it? Can you suggest it for as a first luxury watch? I've done, uh, done quite a few videos on the Black Bay 36, an unboxing, a review, and a year of ownership. Um, I don't own the watch anymore. I did sell it uh, to fund the business. I do regret selling it sometimes. I think it's a really great watch. It sort of depends on what you're hoping for. You know, if you're taking the Black Bay 36 on its own individual merit, as a watch you know you enjoy the fact that it's 36 millimeters that you have the snowflake hands you know all those different things i think you're going to really enjoy the black bay 36. however if you are hoping one day to have the um the explorer 36 mil because often people go for the black bay 36 as an alternative to a 36 mil explorer or an alternative to a 36 mil rolex oyster perpetual I think if you are using it as a substitute for those, you will eventually find yourself falling out of love for it and selling it because it's not what you actually wanted. So just make sure you know what you want and that it is that that you actually want, if that makes sense. So those are the things to focus on. All right, and let's next move on to the two pieces we haven't looked at yet. This is a very interesting watch. It's a Breitling Top Time. Let's get it in focus. So Breitling recently re-released their Top Time, and it's watch that has actually, by the looks of it, going to perform very, very well for Breitling, and they've really knocked it out of the park with that piece. Now this is an original Top Time with a manually wound Valju 773, uh, oh no, sorry, this is a Venus 175, so they made them with the Venuses and the Valjus, this is a Venus. Um, this one is from 1969-1970, and it's a reference 2211. Panda dial, so you have the black dial with the white sub dial striking orange hand, the chronograph hand, and the running uh, 60 minute counter over there.